Uh, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 11th meeting of 2018. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is the decision on taking item four in private, which is consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two is an evidence session on remand, our fifth this year. The main focus of today's session is on the role of the third sector in providing and supporting alternatives to remand, the availability and benefits of alternatives to remand, and existing examples of good practice. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper, and welcome Alan Staff. Chief Executive of Apex Scotland, Rona Hunter, Chief Executive of Scur Circle Scotland, Fiona McKinnon, Partnership Manager, Shine, <laughs> Catherine Baker, Chief Executive of Tayside Council on Alcohol, and Christine Abercrombie, Service Manager, Glasgow Women's Support Supported Bail Service, Turning Point Scotland. Thank you all very much for attending. I, can, I thank in particular Turning Point Scotland for providing a written submission, which the committee always find very helpful. And can we begin our questioning? So, questioning with one from Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, can I start by asking you, um, in previous evidence sessions, we've heard concerns about services aimed at supporting the use of bail or supervised bail and uh, not being consistently available um, throughout Scotland. Um, can you, do you share these concerns and can you suggest any action that might be taken to sort of um, alleviate that? Yes, Alan. Uh, thank you. Yes, convenient. Um, it is uh, certainly a problem uh, in the, the sector, um, and it's largely to do with um, the way that the sector is commissioned, um, that, that services tend to uh, be commissioned on a relatively short uh, phase, so maybe for, for two years or, or, or uh, maybe three. Um, they're very often annualised funding, so there's no security through them. Uh, and they do tend, because of this, they do tend to come and go, um, as a result, people's confidence in them tends to, to sort of die off. But however good they might be, you're never really sure whether they're still going to be there next week. So I think there is a, a, this is a, a systemic problem in the way that third sector services are, are commissioned um, right the way across Scotland. Did you say annual? Um, Sometimes, yes, annualised funding. Very often you don't know from one year to the next whether you're going to have a service again next year. Okay. Anyone else like to comment? Um, there's another issue in that where it is available, it's not used an awful lot as well. Um, I know in Glasgow we've got both supervised bail provided by statutory organisations as well as the supported bail, but we certainly don't get an awful lot of referrals from supervised supervised bail, um, and I don't. As far as I understand, it's not used very frequently. If indeed it's used as a, an alternative to remand, it's more likely perhaps it's used as an alternative to just straight bail. Do you think that's down to lack of awareness or just, you know, just consistent practice of, of, of you know, not doing that, of not, not referring or, you know, people being stuck in their ways? Or it, might be, it might be lack of awareness. Certainly, uh -huh. um, that was one of the issues in terms of supported bail that we had to tackle early on to make sort of sheriffs aware that there are other alternatives, and that's quite a difficult task to do, certainly. And the easiest route for us was to go through sort of defence lawyers rather than sort of straight to um, sheriffs themselves. Um, <clears throat> it might also be that there's a, a, a difference in how it's provided supervised bail across even though it's patchy from local authority to local authority. What it looks like in different authorities um, is worth noting as well. You know, some do have an element of um, support, so it looks more like the sup uh, supervised bail plus that Angelini mentioned in our report, rather than just expecting somebody to turn up several times a week to check in with a social worker. Okay, thank you. I can't comment. Uh, nationally, obviously, my organisation is regional, Tayside region. I think one of the things that we, and we deliver mentoring services, some of which are used to support bail supervision. And I think one of the key things is we, in Dundee, we have a, a court officer. So we have a really good relationship with the court officer and a really good relationship with our sheriffs. And I think that does build confidence in the service. Um, I completely agree with Alan's point. Um, we don't know from year to year what our allocation might be from local authorities. I think we've been really lucky. We've got really dedicated staff who 
hang in there with us. But you know, that, that is certainly an issue in terms of retaining good quality, experienced staff and that continuity of the service. Thank you. Yes, Fiona. I've been involved with Bale Supervision, both in my previous role working in the local authority, but more recently um, with the role I have with um, Shine uh, or with Sacro. I think one of the challenges, and I've had this on both sides of the fence, is with when there is a short-term funding, if the service exists, develops really well, we engage with the defence solicitors who are critical in persuading sheriffs that it's a really good idea for their service, their client to have um, bail supervision. We engage with sheriffs um, and then the funding goes. And these people lose confidence in us. Um, and so if the funding continues or if there's more funding found, then it's, well, should we really consider this again? Because, well, how long is it going to last? And my particular interest in the last couple of years is working with women um, in the criminal justice system. And, and women are extremely hard to engage with. And lots of women we work with feel they've been let down time and time again. And if the service exists and then disappears, and then we've let them down again. So it's really, really hard sometimes to engage the women in the service because, well, what's the point? So it's the short-term funding sometimes feels as if we're, we're fighting lots of different battles battles is to keep people on board um, when things are tough um, and to continue the referral process that comes through and that's that's a great deal of hard work and sometimes you feel as if you're hitting your head off a bit of a brick wall when you're doing that. Thank you. Rona? I mean I'll just reiterate what my colleagues are saying here about um, short-term funding because I think it takes an established service to build relationships. I mean I think when you have relationships with sheriffs or, or with other professionals that takes time to, to bed in. When you have short-term funding it doesn't get the opportunity to do that. I think people I think people refer to services when they've got trust in those services and that doesn't always happen with short-term funding it mm -hmm. takes time to build that. Yeah. Thank you, that's really interesting, thank you. We've got two supplementaries, Daniel and then Liam Kerr. So I, I, I'm very interested in why, if there are alternatives to remand in place, why they might not be, be used, because we know that we've got a very high you know, level of, of use of remand. So just touching on, on, on Kirsten Abercrombie's point there, that, that point that, 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 that alternatives aren't always used even if they're in place, is that particular to, to, to your area or is this something that, that people feel is, is, is more widespread throughout Scotland? And, and, and if so, we've heard about funding. Why might there be a lack of awareness of the alternatives if that's the, the other reason? I'm just wondering if other people could reflect on that. I think it's really important when looking at alternatives to demand that, that it's not just a, a bail, that there's a whole support package. Um, again, you know, I, I don't have a national perspective, um, but I think there uh, are certainly locally what the sheriffs and the um, community justice social workers use is the mentoring as a way of sitting alongside perhaps a bail supervision um, order to provide that, that kind of support and that link in to the other services that might be needed perhaps to address some of the underlying issues that are around the offending. So for the, the women and the, and the men, in fact, who um, are engaged in that process, often there's a real difficulty in, you know, they might know, they might be aware that they need to access other support services in the community, but there are real barriers there. Sometimes that's barriers around confidence and just getting to appointments. Sometimes that's about people having quite chaotic lives. So a real sense from the, the, the folk that we are engaged with of, wanting to make changes, but not quite having the wherewithal or the capacity to be able to get there. So a lot of what our mentors do around that kind of support package is building relationships, engaging with people, keeping track of their appointments, making sure they get to where they need to be, making sure that they remember the appointments. We're talking about people who often have lots and lots of different appointments to get to, and it can be quite challenging and quite difficult to keep track of those appointments. So it's just, I suppose, making sure that there is a real strong package of support that sits alongside um, any bail that's offered. Women themselves are sometimes the people that 
present the women who are appearing at court, they that might themselves be the barrier to accepting bail supervision. And that reasons for that are, are very mixed. I've been in court, and the sheriffs certainly have said this to me in my previous job, where women are actually asking to go to prison because they feel so hopeless. They feel there's nothing for them in the community. And sheriffs feel that they're left with no alternative to women um, to sent either sentencing women or remanding women in custody. And we have a job to try and persuade the women that there are alternatives available to them. And that, that's a big job, but it's also a resource job um, to try and have people available to do that with the women at the time when they're in a crisis, which is often when they're sitting in police custody or waiting to appear in court. So it's a real challenge to persuade women at times that you can, we can do this, we can sort out your housing, we can sort out the health issues, we can sort out your benefit issues, we can start to work with alongside you to do these things that could make a difference in your life. And that, that's, that can be a real challenge. It's, um, there is an issue about why remand is being used in the first place. Um, th there's a lot of evidence which suggests that, that quite a large majority um, is a purely an administrative function rather than a legal one. It's about making, you know, having confidence that the person will be back in the court when they're supposed to be. Um, and it's a nice, simple model. Uh, you put them into custody and you know that they will, will return. So I think it is about confidence. Um, I think the sector itself has uh, an issue there because uh, we're talking about multiple projects and I have a big problem with lots and lots of different projects um, where the, um, the, the sentences maybe are not that confident that they know how trustworthy individual services might be and therefore the default position, albeit a very expensive position, is to remand. Saying there, I think um, we're really looking at that population within remands that are likely not to turn up to court for their trial and, and how we deal with them. And at, at the minute, it seems we're using remand, um, like you say, we're using overlay, but we're also using it as uh, a a full safe means that they're going to turn up to court but there are many other ways that we can help people turn up to court and that's about maybe um, being more creative in our approach that rather than using just straight to remand and that's something that our service does I mean even your GP or your your dental surgery will give you a text message before your your appointment so very simple things like that you can start from there you know giving everyone a taxi to get to court is going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than you know sending everyone to remand and these, these, we are talking about people that have got multiple and complex needs, so it's realistic to think that they might struggle to get to court, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't help them to get to court. And we use a sort of proactive, um, assertive outreach model that um, encourages um, the women that we work with to engage with us in the community and in an environment in which they are comfortable and that in itself will build trust and we, and we can look from there not only to get them to a court date but to deal with those underlying issues that brought them to court in the first place. So if I could just briefly follow up on those last two points. I mean, so the lack of trust there, is that fundamentally about a lack of understanding from sheriffs about how you know, these services work? And if so, what can be done about that? And, and to Kirsten, could I just ask if you're aware of any work to be done at looking at alternatives to making sure that, 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 that people do show up, like giving them a phone call, sending them to, I mean, is there any work going on like that? But if I could go to Alan first at that first point. Yes, L lack of trust, yes. More commonly, lack of knowledge about which particular project happens to be around at the, at the current time. If things keep changing then, you know, quite honestly, the, the, the sentencer has to sort of keep in touch with everything that's going on all the time. It's not that easy. So I, it, it's not just a matter of trust. It's a matter of consistency. Uh, I think Ronan, Fiona, do you want to? Fiona and Rona wanted to say something else. A couple of points um, to pick up on what you were saying as well there. Um, in a previous job, and I understand it's still happening, 
I don't know if committee are aware of this, and forgive me if you are aware of it, but when a person appears in court and they are to return um, to court, they are not given, they're just told the date, so they're not given a, a, a letter or there's no any further reminder unless their defence solicitor reminds them. So often, as you know, when women appear in court or people appear in court, they, their lives can be really chaotic, um, they're really anxious. And to actually hear and memorise, right, OK, I'm due back in court on the 10th of January, I need to remember that, is a real challenge for a lot of people. So often it's not a conscious choice not to appear in court, they just don't remember. So what was set up, and this was at Comarnock Sheriff Court, was a... Um, the staff there were texting the women. Um, remember, you've got court tomorrow. Any problems turning up, let me know. And that was having a real, at the time when I was involved, a real success rate in getting people to turn up at court. And it was a simple measure. And I think the other thing I wanted to say, and this is in terms of shine, that where we can, where we're actually working with a woman and she's due to appear at court, then the mentor, where possible, will be at court when that woman's appearing. Now, the sheriffs really appreciate that, to know that th there is an individual there that's working with a woman that's appearing in front of them, because that means one thing to the sheriff, that that woman's engaged in a service. So that in itself can be real assistance to help the sheriff to make a decision that allows that woman to remain in the community. But that, again, is a resource issue in terms of always being able to do that. So in Shine, we can only do it um, most of the time when we're actually engaged with that woman, not for people that we don't know about. But where we know the women, then we'd always make that as a priority, to be in court when that woman appears, to help the sheriff and to make sure the sheriff knows we're there and to help the sheriff make a decision that hopefully allows the woman to remain in the community and continue working um, with Shine as well as any others. Okay, Fiona? I just wanted to, to uh, just wanted to talk about the, the broader issue about imprisoning parents because I think there's a, a, a huge issue here in respect to the children and the impact on the children. We're aware of adverse childhood experiences and children who have four or more adverse childhood experiences are likely to have poorer outcomes in terms of their general outcomes, but definitely within their health and well-being. Um, and one of, the, one of those adverse childhood experiences is, is parental imprisonment. And for me, in, in the terms of the bigger picture, in terms of looking after our children in our society, I think that we need to really start thinking about what we do with people who are parents and actually is remand the answer for them. And I, I would question that. Can I ask perhaps if child impact um, assessments are being presented when that decision is made? Because that was very much um, what was behind the child impact sentence being legislation being passed. And that. Right. Can I just come in there? In terms of um, the, the services and the women that we're involved with, a lot of the women don't have the children currently residing with them. We have a number of families where the children are with kinship carers. However, a really important part of the work that we're involved with is, is I suppose it's about thinking systemically, thinking about family systems, thinking about families living in communities, and just thinking about bit more out the box about how those different systems have uh, interplay with each other and have a, a, a relationship with each other. So some of the work that we are involved in with the women who we are supporting on either community-based disposals or bail supervision is about re-engaging, building bridges with families and building bridges with their children. And that's, that's really, really important. And we can't do that if the women are then remanded or given custodial sentences. Those relationships are, are broken. So I think sometimes the children are, are less visible because they're either with foster care or quite commonly um, within the family or extended family in a kinship care arrangement. So if a child impact assessment was presented, it may not cover that particular scenario where they're in kinship care or um, someone else, foster care, but there are connections, you know, and they're trying to establish a relationship that might not be taken into account. I mean, that, um, it's not in, in terms of the actual child impact assessments, I probably couldn't, couldn't comment um, categorically, but I think for the, for the children who Absolutely, as a child, you have a need to know your family of origin and where you come from and what your story is. And for the women to be able to retain that connection with their children, whether the children are going to go back to live with them permanently, it's, it's you know, crucially important 
to the future of those children, but also to the women and to the extended family. Okay, Fiona? Uh, I think the likelihood is, if there was a child impact statement provided, it would be after the person had been in remand, not before, because it would be when the criminal justice social worker was doing their um, report and assessment. Okay, thank you for that. And next question, John. I'm very interested to know whether the Criminal Justice Scotland coming into being has in any way impacted on your work at all, please. Can I stop you there? And I've kind of jumped the gun a little bit. We had okay. two supplementaries from the, the last one, which would probably be worth carrying. It was Mary and Liam Kerr. So my apologies, I didn't notice them here. Uh, thank you, convener. It was really just uh, the point that you touched on about ACEs. I mean, there's quite a few members around this table. There's a new cross-party group established on ACEs, and uh, the justice element, I think, is really important to feed into that. And it is something that we have, we all have a, a very big interest in. And I suppose my, my following question to that would be, I can, I, the points that you've raised about the wider impact on the families, that's what we've heard uh, from previous evidence sessions as well. But it's just about young people in particular, and actually young people on that are placed on remand and put in that prison environment and the impact that that has on their lives too. And I was wondering if any of you had an idea of uh, the scale or the numbers of young people that we have on remand uh, at the moment, uh, because I think that is really concerning and again, the wider impact and the impact that that can have on their life when they may not go on to receive a custodial sentence or indeed be convicted. Anyone uh, got that information? No. I don't know the numbers. I just know there's been a massive reduction in right. terms of the number of young people that both have been remanded as well as been sentenced. And it's an, a real big success story um, to work with young people in the criminal justice system, um, that they are being, um, in the main, kept away from the services of Scottish Prison Service. Mm -hmm. And there's a massive amount of work have be, has been done within the community. And there's also a lot of resources have gone along with that to allow them to do that bit of work. But there's so many lessons to learn from the work that's been done around young people in the justice system and um, that some of that can transfer over to the work with um, adults within the justice yeah. system as well. But there really has been a success story there. Great. Alan, yeah. Yes, just to, to back that up, absolutely a success story. Um, we were very, very con concerned that um, a general reporting from, from young people in Parliament was that, that admission to Parliament was actually a rite of passage um, and, and was something to put on your, your CV, as it were. Um, so anything that could be done to keep uh, young people out of the justice system, uh, at least out of the prison system, has to be a good thing. So, yes, it's, it's been a success. In the work that we do with young men, and that this is young men aged 16 to 21, um, is the the, the kind of um, high level of bereavement that they've experienced in the, in their lives. And I think um, again, talking about systemic approaches, what we've seen is a whole systems approach within youth justice. And I think there's an awful lot that we can learn um, from that whole systems approach. Okay, Liam here. Thank you, Convener. Just very briefly, I'll direct this uh, to Alan Staff, although you all feel free to answer if you wish. Um, is there any evidence uh, that bail is being refused because of a lack of availability of your services or the short-term funding that you touched on earlier, or because the judge decides that it is either not suitable for the individual or the service isn't suitable? It would be very easy to actually, uh, very difficult to actually obtain that uh, in, in, in evidence form. Um, most of what, what you have to, to work with tends to be anecdotal um, or it's reporting from the, um, uh, the sheriffs themselves, um, what, what, they're, what they're saying. Um, because the availability of services and the variation in services is so great across Scotland, um, that'll, you know, that, that, that situation will vary enormously from place to place. Um, there, is a, there is a huge postcode lottery um, in, in Scotland in terms of, of you know, what you can and can't get and what, what might and might not be available to you. Um, and you, you couple that with the, the variances of the sheriffs themselves uh, and, and the systems themselves at local level, um, and it becomes very difficult. So my short answer is that I'm not aware of what the evidence that you're talking about would be. Uh, if I can just ask then, if there is an area with perhaps many 
alternative services, many alternatives to bail refusal, uh, is, are there significantly fewer numbers of people held on remand in those areas? Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies, John, would you mind asking your question again? Yeah, no, thank you, Kavina. Uh, morning again. I, I was asking about Community Justice Scotland and any changes that had been following the advent of that organisation, please. I, I, I think it's too early. Um, I think what um, the Chief Executive has brought is such a, a strong message of hope um, for the future um, in terms of listening to her speak. Um, and the ideas and things that she would want to take forward, but I, I think it's too early to actually see if there's any uh, significant changes going to come along with Community Justice Scotland. I think part of the issue as well is that, um, and Karen McCluskey would say this herself, is that they don't have any teeth, as it were. So they can make recommendations about what they would like to see, but don't actually have the legislative powers to ensure that that happens. And I think that, so that's going to take time. And I think that's that just what Fiona was saying. I think it's going to take time to, to bed in. I think as well, um, they, as well as not having teeth, they also don't have a budget to commission services, as, which might be an issue as well going forward. But I would agree with what Fiona said, that it's far too early to sort of see an impact of the, the Community Justice Scotland at, at this stage. I think I'll be... Well, I wonder if, yes, I, I, if I could ask about any other changes, and particularly if, there's, if it's too early with um, Community Justice Scotland, what about its predecessor, the criminal justice authorities? Was there a, a significant change when they went out of existence then? I would, I would say in terms of third sector participation, um, there's been a reduction in our involvement certainly in that those structures across the local authorities and um, the legislation there's only a, a suggestion that they should include third sector within their sort of decision making and their strategic plans which most do to some extent but again we're um, we're the sort of uh, distant cousin and with the kind of influence or um, that we had previously in the, in the old structures I don't think exist to the same extent anymore and again that might be because it's it's still in its infancy but um, and we certainly hope that going forward we would have the same kind of capacity as we used to. So staffed it. Yeah. Um, it it's, it's been quite difficult because there's, a, there's an underlying tension between strategy and the localism agenda. And uh, somehow um, uh, CJS kind of sits in the middle of, of, of that rather difficult, you know, rather difficult position. The CGAA is certainly used to be uh, have exactly the same issue, that, that they didn't feel that they had the teeth to implement the strategies. Um, they could advise, uh, but effectively the, uh, the finances that underpinned those strategies still went through the same process. So the vast amount of, of the money still goes through the, the, uh, the local authority filter. Um, so we kind of changed the, the, the decorations a little bit, but there are some systemic things which would have to change to make this, this work, to make strategy work, which we still haven't addressed. And I know that, that Karen would be the first to, to agree with that that, you know, that is a huge frustration. Well, given that local authorities' budgets were top sliced to facilitate the money the previous criminal justice authorities have, perhaps all the local authorities are doing all uh, their criminal justice work in-house now to... Is that the case? Increasingly the case. To the detriment of, of the third sector? Can I come in? I, mean, I suspect there's variation across Scotland. I think um, maybe we're fortunate in Tayside. Um, we certainly have a seat at the community justice planning table. I think there's a good third sector representation in each of the three local authority areas um, and have an ongoing relationship. And I think that's that's the key for me. It's about that trusting relationship that we've developed with our statutory partners in terms of what we do and what we can bring to the table, not just what we can bring to the table in terms of our thoughts and ideas and service delivery, but also what we can bring to the table as third sector in attracting in external funding from some of our uh, the discretionary funders to enhance what we do. So to provide the if you like, the cherry on the top, um, working towards long-term sustainable changes for the people in our communities. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Ben? 
Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, Rola Hunter, uh, based on um, the third sector making a difference, as, as you know, I'm aware of, because we hosted an event together here in the, in the Scottish Parliament of Circle's uh, Women's Outreach Team Project together with uh, Addiction Support and Counselling. I just wondered if you wanted to, to touch on that as a, as a project that, on, on an anecdotal basis, I appreciate has, has made a difference and also uh, the support it, 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 it collaborated with in terms of community justice. The outreach team is actually funded, and I was going to say a wee bit about that, actually. I mean, we have two services around community justice, but there's, there, well, we have three services. One is through the Shine PSP and two other services, but the two other services are funded through trusts and foundations. They're not funded through any local authority funding. Um, and our women's outreach team is actually funded by Big Lottery. And it's a three-year funded project that we have in Lanarkshire. And it's for women as an alternative to imprisonment. It's not actually an alternative to remand. It's actually an alternative to imprisonment. And women need to be um, either have electronic monitoring or a community payback order in conjunction with our services. So the service we offer is whole family support. So we work with the whole, literally the whole family. Um, so we work with the children, we work with partners, um, extended family if we need to. And we're also in partnership with ESC, which is a counselling service. So we're able to offer the women um, counselling as well as that. Um, we had our parliamentary reception at the end of November last year. And at that point, we'd worked with 38 women and none of those 38 women had returned to prison. And it was because we, we very much take a solution-focused approach, which is, you know, we put the women at the, at the centre. We take a strengths-based approach, which is building on the strengths rather than focusing on what's not working well. And it's very much about relationship building with those women. Um, because I think we hear a lot from the women that we've worked with where they don't feel they're listened to. And I think that's actually crucial to the, to the work that we do is that we listen to the, what the women want. But not only that, we do take account of the broader parts of their life. So we had a parent at that event who was talking about the fact that her partner had an alcohol issue. And because we were working with the whole family, we were able to get him support for his alcohol issue, as well as working to support her and the children. So it's taking that broad approach, really, we find is really effective. As I say, this project is for um, an alternative imprisonment but it could be easily rolled out to incorporate remand or diversion from prosecution. Okay. Yes, that, that's, that's very helpful. And I know from previous years, then, people of Youth Circle have said, you know, maybe I've, I've messed up somewhere. They're still there. Before, if you've messed up, then, you know, that's it. You're, you're in trouble and people walk away. And it's that continued support, keeping it up, that has had such great results. Which brings me to, you know, given this is working so well, you've got 38 women um, who have been supported and, and haven't, um, you know, been in trouble again. Then do you collect any data on the, the current level of use of support services, supporting bail. This is a continual um, thread going through the committee, either lack of data and being able to analyse what's working well and what isn't. So could you perhaps tell the committee if you do collect this data and how it compares to current use, to maybe previous year's use? Fiona. Can I just clarify, you're not talking specifically about women in bail? Well, it was to support, support yes, right. services supporting the use of bail and how this compares with previous years. So, but if you can expand yeah. that and talk about any other data you have, I think we'd be very interested to know that that existed. All women that, who Shine work with, um, and some there might be a small number in bail. Majority of women who are working with Shine are sub are, have served a short-term short -term prison sentence, are on a community payback order, or have been in remand, are in remand, and um, are supported when they come out of prison. We use a, a needs assessment tool called Outcome Star. And Outcome Star looks at a number of measurements um, that are important in people's lives, all our lives, not just the women we work with. So it's things like you know, accommodation, um, your relationships with others, about your health, about your finances. And the woman sits with the mentor and plots where she would see herself in the star around our housing needs or our health needs. And it's very much a joint tool. 
So, and then every six to eight weeks, they will relook at that again. And it offers the women a, a visual opportunity to see where things are improving or where things are, where she's struggling a bit and what areas are important to concentrate on. Now, that measurement allows Shine the opportunity globally to look and see where they are um, working well in some areas and where the bigger challenges are. So we collect it globally, but it's individually for the woman and the mentor that's working with her. And that's its primary focus. How does it work, the, the this, mentor? I wish I'd brought it with me. <laughs> it looks like a star yeah. with nine points on it. And right. the points are graded zero to five. So, or zero to ten. And so the woman and, the, and her mentor, the mentee and the mentor, sit and say, well, um, here's a description of where... Um, if we're looking at housing, where would you see yourself? And it actually offers that description, well, if you were between one and three, potentially that's, you're homeless, really. But if you're way up at 10, you've got a permanent um, house, you've got permanent accommodation. And it looks like the star, so this visually represents what, where the woman would see herself in agreement with the mentor um, around what the issues that she is presenting, the issues that she says she has. And then they look to see, OK, what ones are we going to work on? Not necessarily the hardest ones. We might start with ones that are a bit easier and a bit more achievable initially to build up that confidence. But it's a very visual tool um, that goes along with the woman can have a copy of it, you know, if she wants. But it's a really visual tool. I mean, happy to provide further information to committee if that would be helpful. It would um, be very but helpful. It is, um, it's something that the mentors themselves really feel is a much better tool to sit and work alongside the women. Because that's what mentoring is. Mentoring is not about going and doing things for people. It's about being alongside somebody and that individual, um, supporting that individual to do what the individual feels are the areas that they want to work on. So it's really walking that path with them. But happy to share that, obviously, uh, to committee. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. Then Catherine. Yeah, Turning Point Scotland uses a similar tool to the Justice Star. We use the Recovery Outcomes Web, which is a Scottish government tool. Um, it's used across addiction services, homelessness services, and criminal justice services. And again, it's a visual tool that is 10 points, and we measure short, medium, and long-term outcomes that the women achieve through engaging with our service. Um, I think from being co-located within criminal justice social work offices, our services have sort of learned that in many respects, the third sector is ahead of the curve in terms of recording outcomes and being able to pr produce evidence uh, compared to some of the statutory organisations we work alongside. Um, so I would say that these are really useful and, and sort of you, we have a quarterly report for our turnaround service in Paisley, our residential service, that's 150 pages long worth of evidence and data. So, yeah, we, we gather an awful lot of it, yeah. That's, and is it passed on? We, yes, we, we return it to our funders, to commissioners, um, and to the Scottish Government as well. Uh -huh. And is it graded what's working well and what isn't? Do you go further into the... The analysis? Yes, uh, um, and we look at feedback as well from the people that we work with in terms of um, attribution. You know, where has the change come from? Is it because of our input? Is it because of their own motivation or family supports or social work input? Those kind of things, as well as all our partner organisations, we'll look for feedback from them as well. Okay, and Catherine? So, um, we've just come to the end of the first year of, in Dundee of supporting women on bail. Um, with our mentoring service. The mentoring service really grew out of the Reducing the Offending Agenda and um, up to now was funded through Scottish Government monies. Um, we developed a, a, an outcome template in partnership with the Robertson Trust and, and Scottish Government to measure outcomes. Unfortunately, because we've just got to the end of our first year, I have no idea what the, you know, I've not got a year to compare it with. But um, in terms of engaging, but just suppose as that's the first step, isn't it, to to be engaging with with your customer, with with your um, with the individual. We have a, a DNA rate of only nine percent for the women that we've worked with on, on bail um, supervision. So our engagement levels are are actually really high. Um, we're seeing really good outcomes in a number of of fields. So. Um, preparing people to change, to, to kind of take a step in the right direction, um, having a belief in your ability to desist, because I think a lot of people have had lots of negative experiences which has reinforced a sense that they're, 
They're useless, they're no good, there's no point in trying because they're just a waste of space. And indeed, for some individuals, from a very young age, that's what they've been told. They've been told that through nursery, through primary school, through secondary school. So developing that belief in themselves and the belief in their ability to change and ability to create a different life for them is really important. So we measure that um, using similar tools. Um, key to the work that we do is, is identifying what the needs in, a, in quite a holistic sense of that individual and their wider family network and making sure that they can engage with services. So we don't make a referral to services. We'll say, do you want to phone up to make an appointment? Here's the phone number. Is that too hard for you? That's okay. We'll phone up and make that appointment. Do you think you can get there by yourself on the bus? Sometimes that's a really, you know, it's a really simple bus journey, but people don't have the bus fare or they don't have the confidence to get on the bus or they've been down to that service before and because they have a label as an offender or a drug user, they've not had a positive experience. When you talk to our mentors going into some um, organisations, the GP surgeries, benefits agencies, they, they talk about there being a real difference and that they'll, they'll kind of go in with their mentee. Initially, often the GP or the benefits provider just doesn't realise that they're not just a friend. And as soon as they say, well, actually, I'm this person's mentor, I mean, our, our staff will talk about a switch, a difference in attitude, a different way of treating um, you know, the client at the centre. So we collect information about all of that. Um, I do have a report. It's quite a brief report. <laughs> um, and it, it has been sent to Scottish Government, but I'd be happy to provide that if, if that would be useful for you. Alan and then Fiona. Um, yes, just, just coming back to this whole data collection thing, the, um, the sector, uh, as has already been said, is, is actually pretty far ahead of the, the, the curve on, on how we do this. I think what, we're, um, what we've learned is the value of what the so-called soft outcome. Um, and that is to say that, that there, are st there are stages in development when you're working with an individual which cannot be measured necessarily by, by you know, what the person has done um, you start to think about measuring who the person think they are. So what is their attitude? What are their aspirations? What do they believe they can do? What do they believe they can achieve? Those are actually the more important stages, the more important milestones in working. The other things can be added on. Apex does a lot of things like training, skills training. It does, uh, you know, gets people into jobs. It, it provides work-related environments. <coughs> All of these things are good and they're practical, but none of them make a difference unless you begin to change how a person thinks about themselves. Um, and actually, we do record that, and we can record that. We can demonstrate it. And I think, you know, not just, I mean, Apex does it well. I think the whole sector does it well. We've really got under the skin of, of what this is all about, which is changing a person and changing their, 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 their potential, not about achieving you know, solid, you know, definite milestones about have they uh, offended. Those are markers, the indicators, but they're not why we're doing the job. Valuation of self-worth, actually, yeah. how that's gone up. Absolutely. Fiona, uh, sorry, Rona, and then I'll bring in Liam MacArthur for a supplementary. Just talking about valuation, I just wanted to, to mention, we were talking about the women's outreach team that, that Circle has. We actually have commissioned an external evaluation of that service, which will be completed this summer. And that's both a qualitative um, evaluation and an economic evaluation. Um, the immediate kind of um, feedback we're getting is, A, the service works, and B, it's cheaper. So um, I just want to let you know that, and we're certainly happy to pass that on when it's been completed. And I suppose it's an example of preventative spend. Yes. Yes, which we're always looking for, and yes. here you have it. Yes. <laughs> our director has it. Liam. Thanks and uh, good morning. I, I was wanting to focus on that because I think earlier on in the in the evidence you were you were talking quite a lot. I think all of you about um, uh, the anecdotal evidence that, that uh, had built up in terms of supporting um, uh, a steer away for remand, wherever wherever possible. But I think in the responses you've all given, um, you've you've pointed to a body of fairly firm, um, tangible evidence in terms of 
of, of outcomes. So I was just wondering whether the concerns you have around um, the short-term nature of the funding is linked to um, a, a, a focus by either local authorities, Scottish Government, whoever it may be, on, on the wrong kind of indicators or outcomes, that they're not valuing what Mr Staff just talked about in terms of the, the journey, the attitudinal shift, the, the sense of self-awareness that's absolutely fundamental to embedding any change and what, what uh, what's being um, looked at is whether or not there's any um, reoffending. in which case um, uh, surely that suggests that um, the, the interventions haven't worked. I, I'm just trying to understand whether or not it, it, it's, it's a lack of acknowledging the, the body of evidence that there is that's led to that short-term funding, whether it's just the financial environment we're, we're, we're in and, and it's, it, it's kind of everybody's operating hand to mouth. Um, because it seems to me that all of you are able to point to, in the jargon, kind of KPIs that are that, 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 that are pretty impressive that reinforce the message we've had from uh, witnesses throughout our, our, our inquiry here about the benefits of of, uh, of that kind of support being available. Anyone would like to address that, Catherine? I think the short-term funding is an issue in terms of of, of some of the. Um, outcomes or outputs um, we're expected to achieve. We're generally working with the, you know, the people who need that support package, the people who can't just you know, get on with it and manage, either under their own steam or with the support of their extended family network, are women who've had disruptive childhoods, who have historic or current trauma, who have substance use issues, who have mental health issues, who have poor adult relationships um, with, their, with their family, with their parents, with their partners. There's often domestic violence um, or coercive control is a feature in there. Um, they have housing issues, they experience stigma. I think sometimes in terms of their um, developmental journey, it feels as though they're that that's the, the kind of trauma and the substance use and the mental health issues have impacted on that. And they're a little bit stuck in adolescence at times in terms of being able to fully appreciate the consequences of their actions and, and make the links. They have poor self-esteem, a poor belief in their ability to change. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of talked about some of this. The, 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 the men, the young men that we work with, one of a real, a real kind of key feature is the lack of aspiration. So the, the sort of belief that, well, they're not going to get a job. They're just going to be signing on like perhaps their, their, their family. Or, or I think uh, Rona had said a rite of passage. They're going to end up in Polmont. So there's a sense of an inevitability about their journey. And I think when you have that, when that's where you've come from, you're not going to stop offending get a job and turn your life around in six months or a year. That's, that's a long-term journey. Absolutely, but you mean, you've, you've already suggested that um, the partnership arrangements you have across the three local authority areas are, is very strong. You appear, from, from what you said, to be on the right side. If there's a postcode lottery to this, you, you, you're in one of the better areas in terms of that, that, that lottery. And there's a recognition of... Um, uh, the fact that you're dealing with individuals that, that present with, with a whole series of a multiplicity of challenging conditions. And yet, and there must be a recognition that in addressing those, it's going to take longer than a year or two years. But you're still, t you're still um, uh, concerned about that short-term approach to funding. So I'm wondering why it is that there's not a, there's not a recognition um, even in that relationship that you've described that seems to be fairly positive in what you'd want to see across the country. There's still a lack of a recognition that you need that longer-term um, horizon and, 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 and confidence and yeah. support. Why is that? That's not because people don't accept that the, the, the outcomes that you're achieving, the progress you're, you're, you're making with these individuals is, is positive. I think locally we've got that relationship and that understanding, but I'm not sure that that's, that's there nationally across the country, and I think that then has an impact. Into the local level, is it? Mm -hmm. Right. I think certainly it's not that there's a lack of um, evidence of the outcomes or even an acknowledgement that um, positive outcomes are being achieved. I, I think it purely comes down to financial decisions and financial priorities, and we're still working, like we said, year to year, but the reality of that is that um, this is, we're coming up to the end of financial year this, at the end of this week. Um, my service 
doesn't know if we're going to be starting again on Monday, so it's left to the very last minute as well. So in terms of planning, it's, it's extremely difficult to to look at um, the support and the service delivery on, on, on a long-term basis. And we know from evidence that you know a, a mentoring re relationship takes somewhere in the region of about 18 months to achieve successful outcomes, when, especially when we're working with um, women that are you know so entrenched in, in historic trauma and, and uh, difficult behaviours that we're, we're trying to address with them. Um, and j j just what my colleague was saying here, I think that it comes down to finance. Um, I think you, we can present our evidence to our local authority statutory partners and say that's fantastic, you're doing a great job, but actually how do we find the money to commission a service like that? because they only have so much in the port. And I think what they are doing is bringing things in-house. Um, and I think it's very difficult for them to take money from services that they're providing to give to the third sector, is, is my experience. Anel, yes. I think it's very, very easy, potentially, to point the finger at local authorities. Um, I, I think the, the bigger picture is that there is a, um, a problem in terms of strategic commissioning. Which, or, or rather, is non-existent strategic commissioning. Commissioning is done uh, on the basis that the public sector uh, has to be maintained, first and foremost. And there is no obvious strategy for, the, for what the third sector brings. The third sector kind of exists outside of a strategic framework to fill in the gaps. Um, that's how it appears. Um, commissioning and... and take place because in the sense is I, I, as somebody who uh, represents Orkney for example I, I am not um, going to I, I think make a case for saying that the, the range of services that are available um, perhaps in Glasgow or Tayside or wherever should be available within Orkney but I would hope that there's enough of a range to provide the, the opportunity so the, is that strategic commissioning at a local authority uh, level first and foremost. Yeah, I, I think it's very much about knowing what it is that that should be provided, um, not how it should. You know, how it should be provided. Okay, that's probably is it's a local decision, um, but there is a there is a case that everyone should at least have a a, a sort of broad um, set of a best practice guidance that they should be providing, um, and uh, part of that is that there should be an active third sector provision because what the third sector provides is something different. It is an alternative um, to what the public sector can provide. It's not the same. Um, there will be overlaps, but uh, in, as far as the, um, the user um, viewpoint and their, their acceptability and what they can gain, uh, the third sector brings something that the, third, that the public sector cannot. I'm not saying it's better, I'm saying it's different. Um, and you need that difference. And if you just think, well, we'll just go down a sort of fairly uh, blinkered the, uh, idea that we will provide the service and that's it and that's all you've got, then I think we are missing out uh, on, on the, the potential. The other thing I think we're missing out on is this acknowledgement that the, the third sector provides probably about a third um, in terms of, of um, financial uh, of all justice services. Um, that was certainly all community justice services uh, in Scotland. Um, and you, you can't just have that operating outside of the system as a sort of fallback. Um, we'll just use it as and when we feel like it. I think there has to be a clear vision for how you use, utilise the resource that the third sector represents in Scotland. Okay. Morris. Um, panel, um, what does the supervised bail uh, entail in, and involve in practice, uh, and what are the main benefits of it? Over to either or any of you. Yeah, fair enough. There is guidance for supervised bail that was set out by the Scottish Government some time ago, but it is only guidance. And what the guidance would suggest is that there should be three contacts with that individual person who's on supervised bail um, per week and at least one of them should be in that individual's home, obviously, to check that that's where they live. That, that's guidance. The rest of it's really down to the individual um, service deliverer around what that's going to look like. And that will differ across the country, depending on what resources are. And certainly when SACRO delivered 
um, bail supervision previously, there was um, built into that some support for the individual. Primarily, it had to be something that was seen as very robust because the sheriffs needed to trust that if they imposed supervised bail, that the person delivering that service to the person that appeared in court um, would be monitored and monitored very strictly. So that was a critical part of it. And that's what we had to persuade the sheriffs that was being delivered. But if the person's turning up and they're homeless, um, they clearly have an addiction issue that they're ready to begin to address, then the service provider would ensure that they were linked into these services and to the best of their ability attending these services. Because critically, what then the service provided was a report to the sheriff to say that this person um, did X, Y and Z really well uh, and engaged really well. And that, then that helped the sheriff to decide on a disposal for that individual. So there's always that carrot um, hanging over the person. Equally, there was a stick there hanging over. If you don't engage, things are going to be really bad for you um, when you go back to court. But it's very much a, a, a lottery around what the service is going to look like because the guidance is there as a guidance only. I pick you up on a point there. Um, you talked about local authorities and support. Is it, again, a bit like a postcode lottery? Some local authorities are giving that support to you. It's therefore better in some places, not others? Absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> Is that a general reading of the panel? Yes. Yeah. Right, OK. Uh, just to pick, yeah, sure. pick up on that, I would, I would be way to some extent of seeing bail supervision as you know, a panacea in terms of reducing the remand population, certainly because of that um, variation across the country. Um, and if we're looking at um, the population that we don't expect to turn up for one court appointment, to expect them to turn up for three appointments in one week is, is very unrealistic. So um, when dealing with that level of chaos and uncertainty within somebody's life, I really think that the support element is crucial. And that's when the third sector and the statutory sector can work very well together. Because, like you say, you've got the carrot and the stick. And in the third sector, we sit in a, a very unique position and that we don't have any power over anyone. We can't return their order to court. Um, with our service, we work on a voluntary basis so we can develop a much more therapeutic helping relationship that goes alongside, obviously, the, the supervising social worker. So they, they work well when they're working in partnership. This chaotic lifestyle is a real problem when it comes to um, um, onerous for the people who are like that. And, and therefore, it's not one size fits all, basically. Any other comments on that? Thank you, Vina. Yes, George. Uh, thank you. Good morning. I just wanted to follow on from that as well, and the fact that the third sector, all these projects that we have all over the country, in particular in Paisley, you've got your turning point project that you mentioned earlier on, and that's a classic example for the third sector. Effectively, you know, they're not part of the statutory role, they're not seen as the bad guys. They're seen as trying to help. And is that not a case in, in that project in particular? There's a lot of young men that I met there who effectively could have ended up in remand constantly in that cycle all the time. And is that not what the third sector has actually given the, the whole process? Absolutely, yeah. It just gives an, uh, another tool that, or a disposal that, um, that we can look at, not just remand, but you know, bail supervision, bail support, electronic monitoring. But with the turning point service that you mentioned, turnaround is an alternative to custody or for men that are on um, community orders as well. They've got drug and alcohol issues and it gives them the option of a residential stay where they can address their underlying drug and alcohol issues for six weeks. Um, and at the end of that, they can return to the community. If obviously they, they, they fail to comply and, and carry out the, the rest of their stay, then that can be returned to court for reconsideration. But the same is true for women in Glasgow. We've got the 218 service that can be used in a similar sort of similar sort of way. Instead of sending people to prison or on remand, we can look at you know addressing the underlying causes of, of their offending behaviour. On success of these programmes, you know that uh, the non-reoffending, I'm led to believe the one the one in Paisley in particular is quite good. I know that one myself. I don't know about the one in Glasgow. Yes, um, both very high and, and I think that again comes from that sort of partnership working. We've got social care staff but we've also, we work alongside medical staff, um, visitical, uh, visiting medical officers, nursing staff and a whole host of other sort of um, wider issues are, are dealt with rather than just the offending. And is that not an example, if you bring what Alan said earlier on, of actually being more strategic and thinking that way as opposed to being part of the solution and not seen as just something to come in at the last minute and deliver it cheaper and uh, something that the uh, local authorities or public sector can't do? Yeah. Yes, it is an example. Um, it's, a, it's a sadly all too rare example. 
Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, it's um, been suggested that um, supervised bail doesn't lead um, automatically to a reduction in remand because bail would probably have been granted anyway, and notwithstanding everything you've said about support, which you know, I entirely agree with. Um, what are your views on that? Is, do you think it does lead to a reduction in remand in the long term? I think if it's appropriately targeted, it can do. Um, when SACRO set up Bail Supervision Service in North Strathclyde, the sheriffs, it was taken up very, very quickly um, by the sheriffs in North Strathclyde and in Paisley and uh, Inverclyde, particularly Paisley. And it was, the sheriffs were very clear that they were only referring women um, or making that decision in court where they were considering remand um, for these women. So that was... Um, Within six months, we were up to the numbers, the con contractual numbers that were agreed in the outset for the whole year. So it was picked up very quickly. Now, that was, we were able to measure that on the basis of, unfortunately, it didn't last long, um, because as we say, the funding um, disappeared for that. And this was a service that was taken up very quickly, that was delivered very promptly, and a very close working relationship with criminal justice, social work, with the third sector. And that does make a fantastic difference, where there is that mutual support and mutual trust to work together with the sheriffs on board, because we met with the sheriffs and they were on board, as well as defence solicitors. And the take-up on it was very, very quick. But that was the assurance that we got from the sheriffs. And I suppose that's all we can go by. But the sheriffs were clearly saying, these are the women we are considering for remand. You do a bail supervision assessment. And then they made the decision whether or not they would take it up. And I think in all but one case, they did take up our recommendation. And it worked really, really well for the short time that the service was funded. Mm -hmm. And then we lose confidence again because the service is so gone. So things slip back once that certainty is gone? It's, yeah, uh -huh. That's that's the potential. Uh -huh. Or even if more funding comes on board, it's about you ha then have to build up your credibility. Mm -hmm. Well, how long is this going to last? And it's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really challenging, uh -huh. particularly with projects that have been very successful right. um, and we're able to show and evidence that level of mm -hmm. success. Yeah. And anecdotally, that would be our experience in Dundee, although we've only been targeting bail um, over the last year. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? No? Thank you. Thank you. Morris? Yes, um, there's been an example in Edinburgh here um, where uh, there's been a lack of bail accommodation for, for people and the possibility of people being refused um, bail because they haven't got accommodation. Do you know that's a systemic situation throughout Scotland? Somebody like to pick that up? I, I think, um, as far as I'm aware, that it's, it's not something that really exists anymore. Um, it's the old sort of bail beds that we used to have are sort of taken up by people being released, maybe on long-term licences, uh, post-sentence. But um, one of the things we do to, to get around that is we work in partnership with um, Y people who offer uh, temporary furnished accommodation within the city, but also tenancy sustainment support. So we are able to address issues if somebody is homeless and fast accessing accommodation for them or indeed supporting them through the homeless system in order to accommodate them. But as far as bail beds go, I don't, I don't think they exist anymore. Was it SACRA that used to do, they, they used to, if I remember rightly, involve or something on that, was that right? Yes, way back. Way but back, yeah, but that's no longer the case. No. Anybody else had a comment? I mean, how we might be resolved that? I've, I've experienced times in court where the sheriff has sent the worker around to housing office because he really wants to grant um, a person bail and has been unable to do so. Uh, I've experienced when they've used the solicitor's office um, to be able to grant bail, um, which is a real challenge and I think questionable in terms of what will happen to the woman. So it's, I'm talking when I worked in Ayrshire, Ayrshire was a lot better off than you would have in a city, but there were still challenges around there. And hours and hours and hours that can be spent in the housing office until a person was provided with accommodation. So it continues to be an issue. But I do think there is a... I think there is improvements there. I think the work that's happening at a national level um, with committees that are more focused together around what the issues are. I think, you know, housing support... Um, I think there are, in, there's a recognition it's an issue and there's an, there's an opportunity to make improvements here. And again, it varies around the country. Yeah. And then Catherine, sorry. Yes, very enormously. Um, th there is quite a lot of concern as to whether the, the, 
the concept of the, the old bail hostel, as it were, uh, grouping people together in that kind of, of uh, unstable uh, scenario is a, is a good thing. Um, there's, there's a lot of evidence that uh, supporting people in, in their accommodation, um, separate, if you like, and focusing on their own needs is a rather better model than um, uh, forcing people together in, in the way that, that those old systems used to work. Can, can I ask questions? Uh, Catherine, just oh, before. Sorry, sorry, I didn't, oh, sorry yeah. that's fine. Sorry, Maurice. Yeah, um, can I ask a question? Slightly a side question. Um, are you aware of any veterans who are in this position? Armed Force veterans. Is it a significant percentage? Interesting. Um, okay, slightly controversially, um, it, 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 the thing is what constitutes a veteran? Um, the, uh, many of the forces' charities only consider a veteran to be somebody who has completed their term and has uh, then uh, accessed um, the, the support services that are available to them. They are, they are extensive. Um, however, if you have um, been dishonourably discharged or just decided that um, one tour was quite enough, thank you, um, and gone, then you, you distance yourself from the situation. We have a lot of young men particularly young men, going through uh, the justice systems, going through or a range of support services that we're offering, who um, deliberately have, have hidden their forces background because uh, they felt discriminated against if they um, had come out of, you know, if they've been dishonorably discharged or, or otherwise. So, um, yes, it's a huge problem. It's, uh, there are a lot of services working um, in, in a funny way, I'd say there are almost too many different services uh, working on that. But the bigger problem is the identification and uh, the, the, the establishing of the sort of numbers that we're talking about. As I say, they do hide in the system, um, and many of the, the systems that are set up to keep track of them aren't actually reading them because they, they almost don't exist anymore. Thank you very much. Very interesting indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Electronic monitoring uh, it, as an alternative to remand is not currently available. Should it be? And in what circumstances? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. No, it's all okay. Right. <laughs> what circumstances? As long as support Good. is alongside yes. that. Yes. It can't work on its own. Mm -hmm. I mean, many years ago in Ayrshire, it was electronic monitoring was piloted, um, and SACRO at that point were delivering bail supervision, and SACRO was involved in the pilot. And Criminal Justice Social Work and SACRO felt it was a very successful pilot and it wasn't continued and it was deemed to be expensive. Whether or not, uh, how you compare expensive, I, I'm not sure. So we at that point a number of years ago felt it was a very um, positive model um, to electronically monitor people um, but to provide that support um, as part of it. And that's critical. If that support isn't there then I fear what will happen to people, and it will catapult people into the um, prison services. That, that's my personal view. Just before I move on, um, can I just press you? Do you, you say it was expensive, or it's felt to be expensive. The obvious question then is, do you have any oversight of what the cost of that was as against the cost of putting, putting someone in prison on remand? Far cheaper to be on electronic monitoring yes. plus support yes. services. Yes. It depends how you. It depends how you want to cost something. Mm -hmm. It depends what you want that outcome to be. Right, that's a fair answer. Uh, Alan Staff. Um, yes, I, I, w I would say. In, not in every case by any means. I mean, if if there is is there a need for a little bit more security, a little bit more confidence. Um, then electron monitoring can, can be really, really helpful. Um, as has already been said, it is not particularly helpful on its own. Um, the opportunity that it, it affords, um, if, it, if it's keeping people out of the, the, the remand setting, is that it, it, it uh, allows you to do the work um, it allows that period of time up to the sentencing to be constructive as opposed to the current situation, which is, is not only expensive, but it's, it's destructive to the individual. It's a, it's a time out of their life. 
Um, and, and actually, when you start disrupting people's lives like that, it's very, very difficult for them to get anything, to get back on track, really. You know, that some jobs can go, uh, tenancies can go, all sorts of things can happen during that time when you've pulled them out of their world. Um, and we would say, and I'm sure around the table, it's better to be working with people in that. And if monitoring allows them to, to be safely uh, managed within that situation, then it's got to be a better option. Rona Hunter. I, I was talking earlier about our women's outreach team that we have, and part of that is that the women have to be sentenced to either an electronic monitoring or a community payback order. So some of the women that we work with are on electronic monitoring, and it is very successful because alongside that, there is a good package of support in terms of outreach, intensive outreach, counselling, family support, and so, you know, the women really, um, and, and as I say, up to um, end of November last year, 38 of those women had not gone back to prison. And that, for me, is a, is a sign of success. Catherine Baker. Completely agree um, with my, what my colleagues have said. We're currently looking at um, a support package with electronic monitoring for, for people on a restriction of liberty order in Dundee, but there's no reason why that can't be also used for bail, and, and I would see that as the next logical step. I agree with the comments that Alan has made. I think electronic monitoring is not necessarily understood in terms of um, the, the flexibility that can be there without having to to, to bring the matter back to court. So some sort of variations. We don't want to be preventing people from starting jobs or doing evening classes or doing whatever it is that might be beneficial to, um, to enhance their support package. So I think just understanding that it can be a flexible resource as well. Let me flip the situation. Thank you for those answers. Uh, let me flip the situation slightly. In previous evidence this committee, we, we heard from a defence lawyer uh, who gave an example of a particular client uh, who uh, had been granted bail multiple times but just kept re-offending. Uh, so one of the things th that uh, the evidence said was she is not a danger to the public but her behaviour can be a real nuisance and a disruption for the public. So do you have a view... Uh, where that situation arises on what should be being done in those cases, both in relation to bail applications and in general. Fiona McKinnon. I think one of the important things about electronic monitor monitoring is that there is an assessment done of that individual prior to them being subject to electronic monitoring. I think it would be really helpful to the sheriff to provide that information, to be provided with that information, which would include around the flexibility, but also the suitability, because we don't want to be culpable in supporting people to be. Um, their um, journey into prison being quicker than perhaps it would have been because of electronic monitoring. Within Shine, we are we have been referred to as some really challenging women who, who have worked with various services and have seen to have failed because they end up back in prison again or they don't comply or um, they're just too difficult to work with. And within Shine, we work with several women within that kind of category that have been labelled as too difficult to work with. And the important thing for these women is that we encourage the, the relevant agencies to sit down and plan what services can be provided to that woman. Lots of women we work with have mental health issues as well as addiction issues, have suffered years and years and years of trauma from children right through into adulthood. So just to expect them to work with somebody is unrealistic. So it's really important that people plan what that's going to look like. Now, the woman that you have described, that's what I would, if she was being referred to Shine, that's what I would be suggesting, that we need to look and see um, what best is going to work with in, this individual to try and support her in the community, as well as recognise the issues that she's presenting in the community. And that takes time. It takes time and patience. But where it's not going to happen is in prison. It's not, that change is not going to be affected in prison. So working with people needs to be in the community and it needs to be with the right people. But it's also about, it's not going to happen overnight. Alan Staff, you want to? Yeah, um, one of the, the, the it's just almost an inevitable problem. If, if you return a person back to where they, they were before, I mean, the, 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 if the offending behaviour is, is almost their job, it's almost their, their activity, it's what they do, it will keep happening unless there is something different uh, put in place. I just want to give you a, a quick example. Um, we've got a, a group running in, um, in, in our Inverness service, 
um, where, of uh, women who were um, referred through from, um, from the NHS, women who, who have, are habitual offenders, absolutely habitual, and, and, and it's been going on for, for a long part of their life. Um, and they, um, they began to um, start working volunteering at a local horse sanctuary. Um, and they'd go there early in the morning and they'd come back late at night too tired to do anything other than go home and have a bath and have a sleep. But the difference in the attitude of these women is astonishing. They are contributing, they're, um, they're feeling um, their sense of teamwork, they're feeling satisfied. So there's something about, you know, it, yes, if a person is bored, if they're still just doing the same old things, yeah, you'll just get the same old behaviour. You've got to change that. So whatever you do, it has to be more than just an administrative thing. It has to be more than just, a, are you monitoring? Do you know where they are? It has to be, something's got to change in that person's life. And the only way you're going to do that really is investing in it. Kirsten Abercrombie. Just what you were saying there about um, what do you do with somebody who's repeatedly breaching their bail conditions? I would ask what work has been done whilst they're on bail. And if it's not working, we need to change our approach and how it is working. Do we want to send people to prison that are a danger and, or do we want to send people to prison because they're a nuisance? I mean, it, it seems um, that there are ways that we can work, work around it in that, like we're saying with the electronic monitoring, it re would require an element of support in order to, to affect behaviour change, not just to monitor where somebody is and they're turning up on time. Um, I think, like we were saying before, the issues that these women or men are dealing with the nature of their conditions with drug or alcohol addictions is that they are relapsing conditions, they're lapsing conditions, so they will fail time and time again. But we have to, and certainly in the third sector, we're very good at pers persistence and giving somebody that extra chance in order that they can achieve long-term outcomes. I'm grateful, thank you. Thank you. And Liam McCarthy. Following up on that, we had evidence earlier um, in the inquiry from Social Work Scotland. We were, again, were very positive about the, um, the, the potential benefits of electronic monitoring with all the caveats that you've um, uh, rightly reinforced. But they raised a potential um, issue around um, the, the, the uh, risk of what they called up-tariffing. I read from their, um, what was said, it's, uh, following the original pilots, we've had bail supervision for many years uh, and its use has grown, but it, uh, the use of remand has grown exponentially alongside that. Our concern is about more punitive and restrictive measures being added to bail supervision with no corresponding reduction in the use of remand. I, would, I mean, by the nodding of heads, I, I, I detect a degree of agreement with that. Is that I, how would we avoid that um, as we see electronic um, monitoring taken forward? I, th I think it's something that we, I was alluding to earlier, the fact that we need to provide an assessment. My view would be that before a sheriff would decide on electronic monitoring, then we should be providing the sheriff with information that would allow the sheriff to make that decision. And that's um, being cognizant of the fact that we don't want to up tariff people. Um, I mentioned earlier on about bail supervision, and bail supervision ran for 13 years in Ayrshire. And one of the things that I was determined to do was to make sure that women were going to be a, a target for bail supervision, because they weren't getting it in Ayrshire in the two courts. And I really worked hard with the sheriffs to encourage them to consider women for bail supervision. And they did. It was fantastic, the increase. And then when I checked the demands, they were going up as well. So it was pulling that back and say, how do we focus to ensure that it's only the right women that receive bail supervision? Uh, and we don't do this bit around be, um, increasing women who were on remand. So we did do that bit of work much more thoroughly. And it was ensuring the sheriffs were given the right information about what the alternatives were to bail supervision. Because the sheriff can consider bail, first of all. Um, so jumping from nothing to bail supervision was pretty risky because the next step is obviously prison. Um, equally with the electronic monitoring, it's make sure that we start at a tariff that's low enough. Our fear is with sheriffs that if we don't give them the options, that they will jump to that higher tariff because it's seen as something that could be, well, this, this potentially will stop them from offending. But if they don't have the information that's relevant to them, then I think it's, um, it's high risk for the people concerned. And that's why they need the information. 
in the sense a reflection of a, a, a concern not to appear to be um, going down this route as a, as a soft option that it, that it has to be robust and therefore we're going to make it robust by layering on additional components to it, is that? Yes, and the Sheriff's been um, well content with that idea yeah. and think that's a really positive idea, but do we really need it with that, with that the stage that the woman really needs to have that level um, or man, um, should we not be starting at a lower level and that's I think we, are, we have a response, whoever we are have a responsibility to um, support the sheriffs to help them to consider these lower options first of all before we jump. That is. Can I thank all the panellists very much for attending um, and for the offer of the additional information that you, you um, said you, you could provide on data that would be very much appreciated and um, Obviously, your contributions and comments will um, will influence our report. And thank you so much for attending today. I now suspend briefly to allow witnesses to leave and to have a five-minute comfort break.
consideration of three public petitions. And I welcome Christian Graham for this item um, on petition 1370. And how we'll, we'll deal with it, we'll have comments from the committee and then, Christy, I'll bring you in to comment and uh, we can take it from there. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. And the committee is asked to consider and agree what action, if any, it wishes to take in relation to each of the petitions. Possible outcomes are outlined in paragraph five of paper three. And I remind members that if they wish to keep a petition open, they should indicate how they would like the committee to take it forward. And if they wish to close a petition, they should give reasons. We'll consider each of the petitions in order, starting with petition PE 1370 independent inquiry into the McGrackey conviction. Uh, this petition is discussed on page two of the clerk's paper and a submission was received from the petitioners which was circulated separate, separately to members and published on the committee's website on Monday. Before we commence formal consideration of this petition, um, can I just say that one of the petitions, very sadly, Robert um, Forrester, died last week, and the, the committee would wish to express our condolences to the family. I now invite comments from members on this petition. Anyone want to start? John Finney. Um, right. uh, thank you, Convener. Convener, you'll be familiar with the layout on the parliamentary website of... Uh, uh, how we explain what's happening about petitions. And this particular petition is lodged on the 1st of November 2010. Um, and at that time, it has a, an accompanying spice briefing paper. Th there's then, thereafter a very lengthy list of interventions, including some of the more recent ones, where on April there's a record about um, uh, consideration of appointing an independent prosecutor, um, the committee has written at various points. We've written to the Lord Advocate seeking clarification on the status of the Independent Council working with Police Scotland. We've uh, spoken about um, uh, Operation uh, Sandwood um, and sought updates on that. Um, but I I'm very keen that we keep this petition open. Um, it, to me, it's not about personalities. It's entirely about the process and this committee explaining itself, because there's none of us beyond explanation. I, I include some of the people mentioned in the petition, and most certainly the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. And we know that this has got very many unique features, this, this whole affair. It saw a trial in a Dutch air base. We, we have um, the justice system's response to the serious accusations made by the Justice for McGrahy Committee uh, were woeful initially but have since been picked up, and I understand and enjoy the confidence of the Justice for McGrathy Committee. Um, and they are being taken seriously. That's, that's four years into that. Um, and we have a situation where uh, there has been a, an independent um, QC uh, appointed to support the police in relation to this. But then what? Because uh, ultimately, um, this report has to go to, to Crown Office. And um, as you'll know, I've spoken on previous occasions about the process whereby the citizen concerned about the conduct of the prosecuting authorities um, has confidence that they understand the system. Now, it may be me, and I stand to be corrected by any of the members around the table, but I certainly don't believe we are there yet to understand where that process sits. So I would like um, to, to say, um, the, I mean, present arrangements are, are, are clearly going along, but the, what preceded them was clearly wasn't considered robust enough or we wouldn't be where we are. Um, and I would like us to be in a position to produce some more detailed response at some um, point in the future to explain ourselves indeed. And I think a first step to that would be to ask for an up, update of the brief. Um, I understand it's a very standard procedure that SPICE would produce a, a very short briefing in respect of, of the, the, the proposal. Um, We've moved beyond the proposal, but we can't, we can't ignore the vehicle that's taken us to where we are, where we have had these interests in the different factors concerning the avenues of redress. So I'm very keen that we keep it open and we get an updated brief to incorporate all the information. And that, in turn, will be posted on the, the, the website and would be further explanation to citizens who, 
maintain a very keen interest in this matter. Are there other comments from members? Would it be helpful if I read the petition again to make quite sure what we have in front of us today? It's calling on the Scottish Government to urge the um, Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to open an independent inquiry into the 2001 Camp Van Zeist conviction of Ali Bastali Mohammed Ali Magaraki for the bombing of the Paman Flight 103 in December 19. 88. That's the petition in front of us today. Liam Kerr? Uh, just uh, briefly on that point, uh, to my mind, and uh, the committee will appreciate I'm coming in, I've, I've only been here two years, so I'm not quite sure how these things happen, but I'm looking at it, I'm looking at a 2010 petition, which is lodged on a very narrow remit. You, Convener, you've just read out what that petition calls on uh, on us or the Scottish Parliament to do. Uh, I was listening to, to John Finney, and it, it, I don't necessarily disagree with anything you said, uh, John, uh, but it, I, I think by your own admission, we've moved beyond that very narrow scope uh, that, that was lodged seven or eight years ago. It's a, almost a kind of mission creep, uh, and, and certainly the, the submissions that uh, we looked at before today's meeting just seem to be going off on other tangents. So. If the narrow question being asked is, what do we do with this petition? I, my immediate response, having listened to what you said, John Finney, and, and listening to, to the convener summary, is the actual petition has been almost superseded. So I, I, I fairly quickly get to a point where I say, actually, it's not to keep it open, John. It's, it's to, to close it down. And perhaps, perhaps the petitioners want to look at something different going forward. Uh, but as to the narrow question, is this the right petition? Do we take this forward? I, on balance, I think I'm at a place that says no. Okay. Rona, followed by Ben. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I actually support John uh, Finney's uh, stance on this. I think it may be a narrow question, but it's such an enormously wide issue, encompassing so much, that I think a briefing now to see where we are, just to pull it all, everything together, would be the way forward that we can then make a decision on, on what way to go. Because I think, you know, you're right, it has, things have moved. In some sense, it's been overtaken by events. But I think um, something to say where we are now for the committee, because a lot of us are new members, um, would be helpful. So I support John's proposal. Ben? Thank you, Vera. Likewise, I absolutely support keeping this petition open. I think we need to uh, obtain the briefing, as, as John Finney has said, suggested in order to appraise ourselves of where the scenario is as things stand and also consideration around Operation Sandwood and uh, to consider what steps the, the committee might want to take thereafter. So um, in, uh, as things stand, I'm absolutely in the position of keeping this petition open. Uh, can I refer members to the submission that we, we have received it's our, um, from the petitioners? It's our sincere belief that such political invention is long overdue. It's not good enough for the committee to decide to defer these matters until the Crown Office has considered Operation Sandalwood report um, or the SCCRC has made a decision on the Meraki, uh, Meraki submission for a further appeal, whether they do that or, or not. So... I think the petitioners are telling us that to defer this for Sandalwood, as you're suggesting, Ben, is not some way forward. That's, yeah, that's uh, well, that's one of, one of the reasons, but you're also suggesting, is that correct, that you, you want this, the, the, the spice brief that John has suggested? I said c consideration around Sandalwood, but I was supporting John Finney's proposition to, to obtain a briefing. Oh. Um, and I think um, I, I would also point out that I don't... My reading of the submission is, is that the petitioners are not asking for the petition to be closed. Can I be clear exactly what you want this vice brief to, um, to include, given the previous Cabinet Secretary's response was that any conclusion reached by an inquiry would not have any effect on either upholding or overturning the conviction and it is appropriately, uh, it is, as it is appropriately, a court of law that has that power. So what are we seeking to achieve here? Well, um, I, I go back to, to my earlier point, um, 
convener on the obligations placed on this committee. Now, ultimately, I think our decision on what to do with this petition should be informed by all the information we have here. As has been said, we have some, some new members on the committee. There is an extensive list there. I've just highlighted some of the points that's on this. Um, but there is the wider position of explaining to the people that I'm answerable to what happens in the circumstances that, that this committee have come forward with serious allegations, and these relate to issues like perjury uh, uh, um, and uh, uh, corrupt practices on the part of the Crown, how we deal with this going forward. Because everything about this particular case is exceptional. But are we going to have a new policy? Because if you, the decision were taken to bin it, these issues don't go away. My obligation is to still try and explain to people, and this is the committee where we would do it, because this is the Justice Committee, and the Justice Committee must have interests in the prosecution of crime and the citizen's right of redress when they feel something's gone wrong. The Sandwood, um, the Sandwood report, is, is that impinging on what you are now asking the committee to look at? No, no, I, th I think the update would include the circumstances in which it starts off, it's set up. As you know, there was obstruction under the previous system, mm -hmm. and it was only Police Scotland pull the thing together, and it, it gets its leadership at that point. Um, so that's a factor. We would need to understand what would happen in these circumstances again. There's the role that the prosecution played in that, because you'll recall that, and I've purposely, throughout all my interventions, never talked about personalities or many of the issues that we have in front of us here that the public can read on the website. To me, it's not about personalities. We all have to answer to ourselves, former senior politicians, this committee. Um, it is about understanding process. Daniel, then Liam McArthur. Uh, so, so just briefly, I mean, I think I'd, I'd, I'd broadly re reflect and, and agree with the comments that have been made by, by John Finney, Ben McPherson and, and, and Rona Mackay. But I would just acknowledge what, what Liam Carr has said, and I note that this is a, a, a petition that's of long standing. I note that it's a, 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 a petition which, um, through its uh, course, has looked at, at uh, associated issues. And, but I think that actually lends weight to John Finney's uh, proposal. I think for those reasons, if we're considering what happens next, I think we need to look at that well and truly in the round. And therefore, uh, a, a brief from, from Spice, both looking at where, you know, where we are right now, uh, uh, and I think pulling together the issues, but I think also critically, I think setting out what precisely the, 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 what, what, what our, our options are and those implications are in terms of parliamentary process, I think is quite, quite uh, key as well. And I think I would, just in terms of making a decision about this, would want to understand the, the interactions between whatever steps we take and what and other ongoing processes. Because while I understand the petitioners would like us to take steps and not wait for, for uh, uh, the other processes to conclude, I would just want to understand kind of what the, the potential consequences and interactions might be before we make any uh, particular decision. Lee MacArthur, then George. So, can we, I mean, I think a blend of what um, John has said and, and, and what Daniel's just added would, would capture my view. I mean, obviously, um, this petition has been, been before the committee um, uh, a number of times over this, this session. On each uh, occasion, we have uh, agreed to defer it um, pending the outcome of, of Operation Sandwood. It, it would, I think, be strange were, uh, were we to deviate from that. Uh, necessarily at this stage, but I think the point Daniel's made about um, having some clarity over the interaction between uh, what we are doing and and, uh, uh, and, uh, and other processes would be helpful. I, I mean, I think it would also be um, helpful to clarify the position in relation to Operation Sandwood um, and, and, and what information is going to be made available to this um, committee. It's all very well to uh, to be seen to be kicking the can down the road if there is some prospect of, 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 of information being shared with us in due course. If that is not the case, I think that is a concern for the committee and something we should be uh, pursuing. And George? Uh, I'm supporting uh, John as well and what he's asked for because A, I think he makes a valid point in the fact that there has been quite a turnaround in the committee, myself being a perfect example of it. Uh, Mr Finney's been here since 2010 and before that as well, so he's sat through the whole process and I think 
I need that information before I go any further myself as well. But also, I also take on point of view that uh, John Finney brought up was the fact that this has been, yes, things have moved on, but this petition has been the vehicle of travel. You know, I think that was an important point that John brought up was the fact that this has been the, the thing that's kept pushing the issue forward. And I think we need to get the information. I, I would like to keep it open for that reason so that we can make a more informed decision further down the line. Okay. Do any other members? Fulton. Yeah, just briefly, convener. I've not got a lot to add from what George Adam and others have said there. I would be uh, content to leave it open and get the spice briefing. I think that uh, since I've been on this committee, it's come up regularly, and the, I know the petitioners come in uh, dutifully every every time uh, to hear what's been said. So it's obviously a matter that's of great importance to people, and I would feel more comfortable keeping it uh, on the agenda and getting more information. Any other members, if Morris? Yes, I would agree with that. I agree, understand what John's, John's coming from. And I think, again, I'm a relatively new member from it. it. I did touch on it slightly at the petitions committee was on that. Um, but I would be much more comfortable to hear what the SPICE report is saying uh, and at this stage keep it open. If there are no me committee members, can I invite Christine Graham to make her comments? Uh, thank you very much, convener. Can I thank the committee for the opportunity to contribute? And I must declare an interest as a long-standing member of the Justice for McGrahy campaign. I make it plain. I speak yeah. for myself. Um, can I just say that I'm, I'm pleased to hear what members say about updating SPICE. I think I looked at it and it's 2012 was the last timeline. I may have that wrong. I'd say to Liam Kerr, and I do agree that it's, it's over the time it, this petition has moved on, but many petitions lodged by the public do that. There's a certain elasticity. They're not court pleadings uh, for which you, you, you have to be held so responsible. I, I, I want to just say, if I may, a, couple, a, a few things. For members that are new and younger members here, it's 30 years come December since the Lockerbie atrocity. And as the years pass, in my view, the security of the conviction of Abdul Basit al Megrahi frees even more at the edges. Indeed, if I go so far to say, and I'm looking at some members here, I think they were children, perhaps teenagers, when this atrocity occurred, though I recall it clearly. As you know, perhaps this is a bit of a spice update, Megrahi abandoned his second appeal to secure compassionate release. Uh, Abandon was not a prerequisite for that, for that. Prisoner transfer was, but it was a belt and braces for him because he wanted to go home. So the grounds of the second SCCRC appeal have never, ever been tested in court. Currently, a third application by his family is with the SCCRC, that's Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission. And I wrote to them in September last year to ask them if it could not consider this third application until it has a conclusion from Operation Sandwood and that report is lodged. And I'm happy to provide the committee with that letter. I'll just quote a little bit, and I don't think it distorts what is said. Quotes, it is certainly conceivable, this is in reference to Operation Sandwood, it is certainly conceivable that the board may consider that it requires a copy of the report prior to making any decision on referral but there are too many imponderable factors at this stage to assess the probability of that outcome. And yesterday, um, can I also say that delays in Sandwood, uh, the police inquiry into possible criminal, uh, criminality in this case, can I remind this committee that it was launched in February 2014, four years ago, and the Justice Committee in March 2016 was told by Deputy Chief Constable Ian Livingston it was, quotes, in its final stage. Yesterday, I was advised by your clerks that Police Scotland, one year on, by telephone, yet again stated that Operation Sandwood was in its final stage. Now, I appreciate their complexities, as does JFM, in this particular inquiry. And that may have caused the delay, but can I ask the committee to, uh, uh, suggest the committee to formally ask Police Scotland to provide detail of the number of officer hours being spent on Sandwood since you were last told it was in its final stage, that's 2016, and for an end date. Now, I have to say, put this on the record, it's not a criticism of Police Scotland, because officer man hours will have to be taken from somewhere else to deal with Operation Sandwood. But I do think you can put pressure to get this information in the way others can't. And could I also ask the committee to consider writing to the SCCRC to ask if it's proceeded to stage two, it's done stage one, of its process, and if not, why not? And in particular, if the operation and the report of Operation Sandwood, and then it's got to be referred thereafter to the Crown Office, if that's delaying matters. You see, 
I really appreciate, well, as do others and members of this committee, th that this committee has kept this petition open, can keep the pressure up on this decades-old matter because there are people now who are dying, Robert Forrester's one, but there are victims' families who are dying without knowing the truth about Lockerbie, whatever it turns out to be. And you're not a court of appeal, I understand that. But what you are able to do is to keep pressure up on agencies to ensure one way or the other, either there's a fair from the SCRC and it then goes to appeal and we can at last draw a line under something that's approaching 30, 30 years on from that atrocity. So that's my plea to the committee, more than continuing the petition, to put your foot down on the accelerator and to say to these agencies, this committee deserves to be told, we've been told quite often, this Operation Sandwich is in its final stages, it appears to be a blockage to the, uh, the further referral to the SCRC, we need to know more, we need to put, uh, have more information so that this can be brought to a conclusion and that would be my plea to the committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think there is without doubt a, a real frustration at the length of time that um, Operation Sandwood had, uh, has taken. So if the committee's agreed, we will write and seek further information. And I think you also requested, Christine, that we look at, um, uh, that we approach SCCRC and see where they are, if they're, they're now at stage two, which I think we're happy to do. Is it the committee's um, then agreed position that we get a briefing from SPICE, which will take in all of the things that Christine said, all the points that we've uh, mentioned around the table today, and in, in that case that we uh, keep the petition open and consider um, the, the SPICE brief and determine thereafter how we move forward. Agreed? agreed. Thank you. The copies of my letters to the SEC have seen the response if you're writing. Advice. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Right, moving on. Um, petition number two is petition 1511 Inverness Fire Control Room. This petition is discussed on page three of the Clark's paper. And do members have any views? Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks, Convener. I, I mean, I think it would be helpful, given how, how uh, often we've now returned to this uh, petition, just to clarify um, uh, the, uh, the detail of the response in relation to the FOI um, uh, request, which seems to be the focus of this latest response from the, the petitioners. I think what has changed since last time we considered this is, is our um, undertaking as part of our work programme. Um, to undertake um, post-legislative scrutiny uh, into the uh, uh, into some of the issues around this, it may well be that we're able to to capture some of that in our in our ongoing work. Um, but certainly, I would I would find it helpful um, uh, to get further information, uh, probably from Clarks rather than anybody else, uh, around uh, what has been provided under those FOI uh, re requests. Because, as I say, that seems to be the the principal focus of this latest correspondence from the petitioner. Uh, any other views? Liam, yeah. Uh, just a very small point. I have a lot of sympathy with what Liam MacArthur just said. It, it just seems to me that a lot of what the petitioners want us to do appears to be about to be picked up anyway. Uh, and a lot of the issues that the petitioners seem to be want reviewed, addressed, looked at, uh, are historic anyway. I mean, we, we are where we are. Um, and the, the, the review that Liam MacArthur is talking about, I think, will pick up on it. So I question the value of uh, keeping it open. Any other? Um, I agree with, agree with Liam and, and the two Liams. OK. Uh, on that basis, then, that uh, we think we've gone as far as we can, the fire brigade have no further answers. If there's FOI um, issues to be looked at, perhaps there's a complaint to the Freedom of Information Officer. But we would close this petition, um, but um, there may be issues that were raised in the course of it, the general principle of control rooms that may, may well be covered in um, work undertaken under our future work programme. John? Thank you, Convener. Um, I think it is appropriate that uh, the, the, the post-legislative scrutiny um, provides a, an opportunity to look at aspects of this. I just wonder, would that be shared with the petitioner? 
that, that that's We important. can make a point of doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Are we content to move forward <clears throat> on that basis? Thank you. The third and last petition we're just uh, looking at this morning is the petition on private criminal prosecutions in Scotland, and this is discussed on page three of the clerk's paper. There were a lot of submissions for this. Do members have any comments? Rona. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I should probably declare an interest in that this petitioner is a constituent of mine. Um, I think, as you say, we, we received a lot of submissions which made for very interesting reading. It's a big issue. It's a a very serious and important issue. Um, I would s suggest that we, we should ask the Scottish Government for, for their opinion. I don't think that's been, been asked for yet. Um, and I would also like to see the petitioner and some of the um, people who responded uh, maybe come and give verbal evidence, evidence um, as, as a start, as a way forward. Are there other um, views, Liam Kerr? I think Rona Mackay makes a good point on that. The, the one thing that did majorly concern me, one of the submissions seems to suggest that the proposal would out be, out be outside legislative competence, and I'd probably want to understand whether that's the case or not. Peter, can you... Just have a seat. Um, is it the committee's view then we keep it open, we seek legal advice on this point and in the meantime send these submissions to the Scottish Government to get a response and then we can see more clearly where we go after that. Okay, if that's the case, that's the way forward and the committee um, agrees to keep it open pending um, these actions. We now move into private session. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be after the Easter recess. We now move into private session and I don't think we need to suspend briefly because there are no witnesses. So we can move right on.